Theory of Flight. I'm your host, Ray Preston, and this web channel is dedicated to answering the question, how does an airplane fly? Now, if you've ever Googled the question, how does an airplane fly, you know that there are thousands of websites out there on the internet that answer that question. So why do we need one more? Why am I doing this? Well, I have to admit, I haven't looked at every one of those websites, but I've looked at a lot of them. And every one that I looked at was wrong. So I decided I'd better do something about that. And I decided to make this web channel. But you're thinking to yourself, well, why should I believe your explanation any more than anyone else's? So I'll, maybe you'll be polite and listen, and then you'll make up your mind which one you like the sound of best. So I didn't want that to happen. So I decided to make this web channel with two main purposes in mind. One, of course, as I said, is to explain how does an airplane fly. But the other purpose, which is at least as important, is to examine critical thinking and what's known as philosophy of science. Out there in the scientific community, scientists don't just pick the theory that they like the sound of the best. There is a method for figuring out which is the correct theory. So as we go through the analysis of how an airplane flies, we're also going to learn a little bit about the philosophy of science, some critical thinking, how to tell the difference between a good explanation and a bad explanation, the right answer and the wrong answer. So I propose we just jump right in by looking at what I call the standard explanation of how an airplane flies. You can find this repeated all over the internet. It goes something like this. I've got myself two balls here, and I want you to imagine that they represent parcels of air approaching the wing. Now, we'll just zoom in here so that you can see this a little bit better. So these parcels of air approach the leading edge of the wing. And the lower one is going to pass along the bottom of the wing. The bottom of the wing is relatively straight, so it's going to go by more or less unimpeded. But the upper one has to follow the curved surface of the wing. So you can see it following the curved surface. Now the standard theory says that both parcels of air have to reach the trailing edge at the same time. Why they have to reach the trailing edge at the same time is never really explained, but let's give them that one. So the explanation says that, therefore, the air accelerates due to the curve. And I was thinking about that as I was driving out to the airport this morning. Well, we're on our way to the airport right now. To get there, we have to go over that overpass. But first we have to go around a curve. If there's nothing to worry about. The car will speed up automatically as we go around the curve. So we'll get there in the same amount of time as if it was a straight line. Well, here we are, starting around the curve. The car should start to speed up here pretty soon. Okay, come on, it should be speeding up now. Something seems to be wrong. The car is not speeding up. I don't understand it. Must be something wrong with my understanding of physics, I guess. Science is useless. Scientists are completely wasting their time. Unless it is the case that there are universal laws of science. And that, of course, is the underlying belief of all scientists, that there are universal laws that apply to everything, everywhere, every time, no exceptions. Now, philosophers can debate whether that belief is true. But to a scientist, that is the bedrock belief that all science is built on. Now, it's my belief that most pilots probably all pilots want to be scientific. And that simply means we want it to be the case that there are universal laws of science. Now the opposite to universal laws of science is what we call ad hoc explanations. In critical thinking we call it the ad hoc explanation. It's just a fancy Latin word that means one-off explanations. 
The standard explanation of how a wing flies starts off with an ad hoc explanation. It says there's something special about air. Air is different than everything else. When air travels around a curve, it speeds up just because it's going around a curve. Now, you saw the car does not speed up just because it's going around a curve. The Earth is going around the sun. And even though it might sometimes seem like every year is a little shorter than the one before, we know that's not really true. The Earth is not speeding up just because it's going around a curve. In fact, according to Newton's second law, nothing is going to speed up unless you apply a force to it. When I drove my car around that curve, if I wanted it to speed up, I'd have to step on the gas, applying a force that would accelerate my car. So if it's really true that the air accelerates over the top of the wing, there must be a force. Something must get behind that air and push it. Some mysterious force, like the Jedi Knight's force. I don't know what it would be. But whatever it is, it's missing from the standard explanation of how an airplane flies. But the standard explanation actually has two parts. We've only dealt with part one. Part one claims that the air accelerates over the wing. Maybe that's true. I don't know. We don't really have any explanation for it, but maybe if we look hard enough, we can find that mysterious Jedi force that accelerates the air over the wing. But we're only halfway there because the standard explanation then says, OK, so the air accelerates over the wing, and now the pressure decreases. You want to know why the pressure decreases? I'll tell you why the pressure decreases. It decreases because of Bernoulli's principle. Now, as critical thinkers, we have to ask ourselves, is this really an acceptable explanation? A good trick to use when you're trying to evaluate an explanation is to just make a little bit of adjustment, keep the form of the explanation the same, but change one or two details. So how about I give you the exact same explanation with one little change. Here it goes. So the air accelerates over the top of the wing, and the pressure decreases. You want to know why the pressure decreases? I'll tell you why the pressure decreases. It decreases because my uncle Fred says so. Now at this point, we recognize the problem with this explanation. You immediately say, so who the heck is Fred, and why should I believe him anyway? But in the first case, we were given the name of a famous scientist, Daniel Bernoulli. But if you really read between the lines of this explanation, and that's the secret. As critical thinkers, you have to learn to read between the lines. So here's what the explanation really says if you lay everything out in the open, leave nothing between the lines. Here's how it goes. So the air accelerates over the top of the wing, and the pressure decreases. You want to know why the pressure decreases? So do I. I have no idea. But there is this famous scientist called Daniel Bernoulli, and he knows why the pressure decreases. At least I think he knows why the pressure decreases. But in any case, he said that the pressure would decrease. And it's going to be on the exam, so that's the answer. Any questions? Now, in all seriousness, that is the explanation that's commonly being given. But you, you may be saying, come on, Ray, you're not being fair. This is not fair. We understand Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle is really simple. It goes like this. Whenever the air accelerates, whenever the velocity of air increases, the pressure decreases. That's Bernoulli's principle. So the pressure decreases over the wind because the velocity increases. There you go. Now, as critical thinkers, we have to recognize what we have here. It's a statement, and it's a statement in the form of a claim. Now, in science, claims are treated very special. Let me give you another example. Somebody says, every object in the universe, without exception, attracts every other object in the universe with a force that we will call gravity. Now, that's a claim. and it, I mean, it's an amazing claim. It's, it's an incredible claim. And we recognize it immediately as Newton's theory of gravity. So in science, when you make a claim, we don't call it that. We call it a theory. So we have here two theories. One theory that says every object in the universe attracts every other object. We call that Newton's theory of gravity. And we've got this belief, this theory, that when the velocity of air increases, 
the pressure decreases. That's also a theory. How do scientists deal with theories? The answer is they conduct experiments. So uh, to test Newton's theory of gravity, scientists take objects and we check to see if they attract each other. These two objects attract. Now, at this point, as a philosopher, I have a little bit of a nit to pick with scientists because they have a tendency at this point, having conducted the experiment, to say, I've confirmed Newton's theory of gravity. Strictly speaking, you cannot confirm a theory. What they really should say is, I've conducted an experiment and the results are consistent with Newton's theory of gravity. Of course, one experiment is not going to be enough. So we do another one, and another one, and another one. Pretty soon we did a million experiments. And every one of those million experiments is consistent with Newton's theory of gravity. But the rules of science are very clear. It says it doesn't matter how many experiments you do, you can never prove the theory is true. It's always conceivable that tomorrow someone is going to pick up two objects, measure the attraction between them, and say, hey, there's no attraction. At that point, we'd have to say, you know, call up Newton and say, hey, Isaac, you know that theory of gravity idea that you had? Turns out to be wrong. But so far, that hasn't happened. Newton's theory of gravity has been tested countless times. And every time it's tested, the results are consistent with the theory. So as philosophers, we say it is reasonable and prudent for us to continue to believe in Newton's theory of gravity and make our scientific predictions on that basis. Now, we have a theory. Our theory says when the velocity of the air increases, the pressure decreases we need to conduct an experiment to see if that theory is true. So, come with me. This is a Cessna 172. And this is the static port on the side of the Cessna 172. Now, the purpose of a static port is to measure air pressure. So the static port is connected through a tube to the altimeter. And if the pressure of the air right here decreases, the altimeter will show a climb. Now, we have a theory that says when the velocity of air increases, the pressure will decrease. So we're going to do a very simple experiment. We'll taxi the airplane out to the end of the runway. We'll get all lined up for takeoff. Now, the velocity of the air going past the static vent is zero. We then start the takeoff roll. The air goes past 10 knots, 20 knots, 30, 40, 50. So the air is accelerating. The velocity is increasing past the static vent. According to our theory, the pressure will decrease. That will show on the altimeter as an increase in altitude. Now, if that experiment actually worked, that would count as a consistent experiment. But as every pilot knows, that's not what happens. So even though the air is accelerating past the static vent, there's no decrease in pressure. We know that because the altimeter doesn't move. Now, according to the rule of science, while there's no limit to how many experiments that you can do that are consistent, there's never enough to, com to uh, completely verify a theory. It only takes one inconsistent experiment to disprove a theory. So there you have it. We've conducted an experiment, and it's inconsistent with the belief that an increase in velocity results in a decrease in pressure. So we're going to have to give up that theory. It's clearly a false theory. So we've reached the end of episode one. And we're actually in worse shape than we were when we started. We've examined the standard explanation of how an airplane flies and found that the first part claims that the air accelerates over the top of the wing, but there's no explanation of the force that would be required to accelerate the air. The second part says that when the air accelerates, the pressure would decrease. But we've examined that theory and found that it's false. Now, I want to clarify something at this point. I am not saying that Bernoulli's principle is false. 
What I'm saying is that what's typically taught to pilots as Bernoulli's principle is false. As far as I know, every time that scientists have tested Bernoulli's principle, it has been consistent with the results of the experiment. So I promise you, before this series is over, we'll learn what Bernoulli's principle really is. So our objective is going to be to move forward starting with principles that everyone can agree to and moving in logical steps forward until we finally reach the point where we understand how an airplane flies. We've got an entire season planned. There are eight episodes. We're going to need all eight. But by the time we get to the eighth episode, we're finally going to understand how it is that the air can hold an airplane up in the air. I hope you're intrigued and you're interested. If you are, we'll see you again for the next episode. Until then, I'm Ray Preston, and this is Theory of Flight.